Welcome to this evening public lecture. May I request all the audience to be seated so that we could start the session, please. Okay, we are going to start the session. Um, it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Garg Narthoff. Uh, he's a Canada Research Chair for Mind, Brain Imaging and uh, Neuroethics uh, at University of Ottawa, Canada. Um, he has unique credentials, uh, which we usually discuss as uh, he's a multidisciplinary team by himself. He is a MD, uh, he is a clinician, psychiatrist, and he has a PhD in neuroscience, and he has the second PhD in philosophy. And um, he is the leading authority in depression and catatonia in clinical fields, and um, his research focus on, uh, is on um, neural and biochemical mechanisms related to self and consciousness, and his major contribution um, has been that he discovered the uh, cortical midline structures as the neural basis and their association with the sense of self. So we will have the uh, lecture, it's a pleasure, and uh, welcome. Um, so we'll have the lecture for 40 minutes, and then we will take the question and answers as per the uh, previous sessions. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, thank you for the kind words. Thank you for inviting me. And um, this is a very, very interesting conference. And I think in a way, please forgive me, it really reflects the dualism between science, what we had yesterday, particularly in the afternoon, high-level science, and this afternoon we had sort of the deep layers of experience. And in between there was psychiatry and schizophrenia. And uh, this really cuts right across the boundary between experience, observation, between science, philosophy, or phenomenology, if you want to say so. And it is really sort of my task uh, that's basically what I'm doing, trying to map out these boundaries and to make a crosstalk. And I start uh, being a philosopher with a typical what question. You know, the empirical scientists ask how question, how does something work? I ask first, what is the brain? In particular, what is the model of the brain? Some of you may know this famous movie, Frankenstein. It's always a pleasure seeing that. And um, and it's really the question is, like the 19th century German philosopher Arthur Schopenhauer raised the question, is the brain nothing but uh, a gray uh, pulpy device? I added gruesome to it. Uh, so the question is, how does something like that gray and pulpy can bring force or be involved or contribute to something as colorful as our experience? My entrance door to that is what I'm trying to do as a scientist. I try to develop models of the brain. And that's where you can see this one. Can the look towards philosophy very helpful? Because philosophy, I talk here mainly of Western philosophy because I'm not an expert in Indian philosophy, but you might help me in that. Uh, the models of mind uh, there have been different models of mind in the Western philosophy, as for instance Hume, uh, Kant, Spinoza, Descartes, etc. And uh, you can see here, I'm a, a German after all, so one uh, point of departure for me is Kant, but Kant in a very liberal sense, as you see. So let me uh, contrast you with uh, two alternative, of course it's very roughly sketched, but models of brain. So the first model, which I discussed in this paper, 2012 here, is really, uh, let me see, uh -huh, okay, good. It's really, this is the traditional model of the brain, and this is most of the model we really also perceive in current, uh, presuppose in current cognitive neuroscience. So we have a, a stimulus here, you see the Colosseum from Rome, and that stimulus is supposed to induce uh, activity in a certain region or network, and most important, we call the stimulus-induced or task-evoked activity, and that uh, uh, is supposed to be sufficiently related to the stimulus. And that is really the design we have in cognitive uh, neuroscience experiment, much of neuroimaging. Uh, this is really where we try to link the stimulus and the observational neuronal activity. And then, of course, the problem is where does consciousness itself come from such a model is somehow mysteriously arise. So there's a gap, philosophers call this, Western philosophers, explanatory gap. So when you follow Kant, you might presume an alternative model, which sort of somehow has been on the sidelines of neuroscience, 
one uh, student of Charles Sherring, Graham Brown, already observed spontaneous activity deep down in the spinal cord, irrespective of any movement. And that has been somehow uh, on the sidelines developed by Lashley, more in theoretical aspects, Linus is a strong proponent, punks up in behavior, and most recently, the default mode network, uh, 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 Reckler. So here the model is slightly different. Here we have an intrinsic spontaneous activity, and whatever it is, my talk will focus on this, and with that, uh, spontaneous activity or resting state activity, we approach the stimulus. Meaning we can have the same stimulus, but we experience at two different t points in time and we experience it completely different. So there's, uh, and then what we see as stimulus or task evoked activity is really a result of the interaction between resting state and the stimulus. And this is, of course, obviously a central issue. And then you will see the central claim of my talk is that this spontaneous activity is central, is indispensable, is a neural predisposition, a capacity, not a neural correlate of the sense of self and consciousness. So, um, plan and outline of my talk. So, obviously, central issue here, uh, spontaneous activity or resting state activity. Uh, how is that related to the sense of self? So, there is some... Uh, open for some surprises, at least from a neuroscientific point of view. Then I try to link that to consciousness, and then in the very short muted part, I link, try to link the resting state uh, and the self to the world and environment. So it's basically three parts, first the self, consciousness, world environment. And I show you empirical data, which over the years we assembled, and at the end of each section, I show you some neurophilosophical implications. So that's also for up, open for up some prizes because you will see that some of the traditional concepts and problems you have in philosophy might need to be reformulated in order to be empirically plausible. Yeah? So empirical plausibility. So philosophers among you, please don't misunderstand me. I'm not after what David Chalmers would call logical conceivability. I am after empirical plausibility within the natural world. I'm not interested in the logical world. I restrict myself just to the world we live in. It's very important for philosophers uh, as an uh, a priori comment. Okay, so title you already know, and thank you to the various lab members. We have a quite uh, colorful group from all kinds of countries and all kinds of disciplinary backgrounds, so I'm basically daily confronted with cultural differences and uh, disciplinary differences. Okay, let me start with the self first part. Uh, Naren already pointed it out very nicely in his talk. Uh, we early on did a, a meta-analysis of studies uh, of self-referential or self-related processing where you are presented a stimulus like say a picture from Bangalore and then you get another pic, and that is of highly self-related for you, so it's very personally relevant for you. And at the same time, and then you also get a stimulus from Ottawa uh, in Canada where I live, minus 30 degree snowstorm. I'm sure this has not a high degree of self-relatedness, except when you're from Moscow. Yeah, so, um, so and when you compare these two kinds of stimuli for the respective individual person, meaning for you, then you see a lot of uh, activity in the, in the midline regions. See, it's really the cortical midline uh, structures. Naren already pointed that out very nicely. And uh, until now, we, something is special with these regions. There's no doubt. Uh, but what is special, I assume that there are such special, specific physiological features. I will come back to that. So then uh, Naren already pointed that out. Also, the most surprising thing that others in our own studies showed that there is an overlap between resting state activity and self-related activity. And that's where it becomes very strange. Because you would expect that the uh, self elicits the highest deviation of activity because it's the most important, rather than basically overlapping with the resting state activity in this region. So this is a very strange thing. Philosophically, this has major implication because it might mean that your resting state is highly individualized. I don't want to use the concept of subjectivity here, but highly individualized. And I will try to lend further uh, empirical support for that. So, and now I show you uh, two recent studies, which we did because this rest-self overlap, as I call it, is absolutely central for me. Because this is the key to the way, the, uh, to the potential role of the spontaneous activity and what it might do and its potential role. And also, for me, the potential role to, for mental features slash experience consciousness. Uh, 
Okay, so here we did uh, single unit recording studies in collaboration with Toronto people. You know, in depression, they do this deep brain uh, stimulation in the uh, anterior region here, in, the, uh, in exactly this region here, down here. So, and we had the chance of uh, testing that, and we also did, in addition, some uh, Parkinson patients. Uh, and we presented them with their own name and another person's name. So that's a typical paradigm we like to apply, own name, other names, very simple, because for your own name, psychologists among you, there's a cocktail party effect, you immediately recognize your own name among all the noise at a cocktail party. So what you see in the uh, uh, Parkinson's patients, we had the subthalamic nucleus, basal ganglia region, and you see that they make a clear difference between the own name and the other names. So these are single unit recordings firing rates. So I'm, as an imager who usually does not have access to kind of data, I'm very proud of that. So, and you can see here there's a, a clear increase. This is zero, this is a histogram, these are firing patterns. And you see a clear increase in the firing rates in response to the own name. So now, so these were Parkinson patients, 10 Parkinson patients. Now we did the same in uh, uh, depressed patients in the perigenial anterior cingulate core region of the default mode network resting state. And you don't, do not see such a difference. You simply do not see an increase in the firing rate. So how is that? So why is that? How is that possible? So imagine uh, you meet an unknown person. You meet me for the first time and you change your behavior. You're somehow formal because you have no idea what this Canadian guy is about. If an opposite, you meet a good friend you just remain the way you are, nothing changes in your behavior. So I would argue that here the same thing, that apparently the resting state or the spontaneous activity somehow, uh, forgive me philosophers for this metaphorical uh, formulations, somehow knows the self. Somehow is uh, self-related stimuli like the own name. So, and that means there must be a special interaction between the resting state and the task evoked activity. Remember what I said initially that your neuronal activity, your task evoked activity is the mixture between rest, the impact of the resting state and the stimulus. And so this is, was an earlier review paper 2010 in Trends in Neuroscience. And then we had a just this uh, impress, very fresh. So here we really showed for the first time that it is a non additive or non linear, whatever you want to say, interaction between task evoked and stimulus induced activity. Meaning, the, ta the, the resting state adds a certain component to the task evoked activity. And of course now the next question is what is the behavior of phenomenal relevance of this contribution, this non-additive contribution by the resting state. So this is a subject of future research. Let me come back to the uh, self. So, you, so now how is the relationship between resting state or spontaneous activity and self-specificity as I call it here? You can have a rest self overlap, you can have the same regions, spatial overlap, but you have different neuronal activities. Can happen. Yeah? Different for the brain image or different voxels, or just it's different neuronal activity within the same region. That's possible. So that would be a pure spatial rest self overlap. Alternatively, you can have that resting state activity is identical to self related activity. Obviously, this is a much stronger thesis than this one. And you can test this. This is what you want. You can experimentally test this. So if you present stimuli in both cases, so if you present stimuli and let the subjects rate whether they are high or low self-related, you would say that the resting state here should not predict your ratings of self-relatedness. Whereas here, if it's identical, it should predict. OK, so this is a study we did. Uh, here, this is a combined EEG spectroscopy MIS magnetic resonance uh, study. Uh, um, so here, uh, we uh, did an EEG. Here is a paradigm. So subjects had to perceive uh, emotional pictures, uh, very short, and then a short fixation cross. And afterwards, they had to judge whether it's high self and low self. And we were interested in whether this pre-stimulus period here, the pre-stimulus resting state, predicted the judgment of these pictures. So this is a testing for the hypothesis of rest self containment. So, and then we applied this in EEG and also with uh, spectroscopy and of course my favorite region, perigeal and the sing singlet cortex. Okay, here you see sort of as an entrance point, you see some different event related potentials. Uh, you see a clear difference. We grouped, sorted all the trials according to high self and low self, according to the subjective judgment. 
Uh, and then for stimulus onset, and you can see a clear difference between high self and low self stimuli in the event related potential. So now we go back, so this is post stimulus, so we were interested here in the pre stimulus period. So, and this is what you can see here. So, here for the EEG experts among you, we did event related spectral perturbation, ESP, so uh, put it into normal terms, it's basically the degree of power in different frequency bands. So you have frequency fluctuations in your brain of neuronal activity, and these frequencies can uh, fluctuate very uh, uh, fast. These are fast frequencies, or they uh, fluctuate rather slow, then you have long cycle durations, and it's the power of these frequency fluctuations which we measure here. So and what you can see here, so this is a relevant picture, so you see pre-STIM here, this is as a low self trials, where you see pre-STIM minus 500, you see a decrease in alpha. It's a particular frequency between 8 and 12. And here you see in the high self trials, you see a pre-stimulus increase in alpha. So whatever it means for the non-experts among you, you can say what is important to take home message from this slide is that you uh, say that the pre-STIM resting state activity predicts whether you will judge the stimulus as high self or low self. And important, this is just probably the spontaneous dynamics, as we showed in the other paper, which I showed you, the rest stimulus paper, of the ongoing resting state activity. It might not be that there is a particular predicted input, as for instance suggested by predictive coding, but there is just a spontaneous ongoing dynamics, sort of by chance, uh, that we had an increase in alpha here according to the cycle duration, and that predicted uh, whether the subject judged uh, high self or low self. So this is the first point where I say, okay, we need to go into the spatial temporal dynamics of the resting state, and we somehow discuss this here. So then uh, we also did, it's just on the sideline, not that important here, that the uh, glutamate, here the level of glutamate, the concentration of glutamate in this region, predicted the alpha uh, power and hence the self-relatedness. So uh, this uh, sets a very interesting uh, hypothesis or theory for conceptual issues. What, how can we define the self? I know that uh, Owen Flanagan uh, distinguished 12 notions of uh, self or variation, as he called them, which I liked very much. So when I mean here by self, it's a very basic sense. I mean a sense of self, uh, an experience of a sense of, of, of self, or in operational terms, that's a f phenomenal uh, approach. Um, in operational terms, it would probably be a basic self-related processing, how the brain relates, this brain and spontaneous activity relates to external stimuli. So it's a very operational basic, and that is to be distinguished from what was this morning very much in schizophrenia, the self-referential processing, where you have trade adjectives and you become aware whether these are related to yourself. I would argue that in schizophrenia, it's very much basic. I think you are even had a slide where you had different levels of self-consciousness or consciousness, and you uh, went for the upper ones, and I said, he needs to go for the lower ones. Sorry. <laughs> yeah? So, and this is where I'm targeting here. So, a uh, recent paper where I really said, is this now, uh, is the self a higher order function, a cognitive function, the highest integrator, a homunculus, or the conductor of the orchestra. That's probably not the case when you see, look at my data. Instead, the self and its individualization is already deeply encoded into the spontaneous activity spatial temporal pattern. Here's another finding, I just show this uh, short graph, which uh, will come out soon. Here we did uh, spatial temporal, temporal structure described by the power law of the spontaneous activity. And uh, at the same time, we had a self-consciousness scale, and you have one subscale here, private uh, self-consciousness, and you can see very nicely that uh, um, the higher your uh, power law exponent, meaning the more, and this is now important because this was an fMRI uh, investigation, the stronger your infraslow frequency fluctuation, which you measure in fMRI. So these are extremely slow frequency fluctuation in the range of 0.1 hertz to uh, 0.001 hertz to 0.1 hertz. So with extremely long cycle durations, uh, 
and the power law uh, shows higher values when you have more power in the very infraslow frequency fluctuation. And you can see this, uh, the higher the power law exponent, the higher the private self-consciousness score here. You see, you might see this, uh, the, the blue and the red are the high and low. So we did a medium split, which also came out. So that really suggests, and this is obviously very, in the, very much in the initial stages, what you can see here, that we tried to apply measures of spatial temporal dynamics uh, to the spontaneous activity. And then preferably having the same measures of spatial temporal dynamics to the behavioral data. So when you have a button click or you have a heart rate, you can apply the power law to the heart rate and you can apply the power law to the spontaneous activity. And I would expect that they highly correlate because the heart rate every second is supposed to come, uh, I hope so, for everybody that structures, gives temporal structure for your frequency fluctuations and their cross-frequency coupling. What does this mean conceptually? So this means that I would claim that there is a strong overlap or rest self-containment, as I say, that really resting state activity is self-related activity. Then this is basically uh, explains it, and that in turn impacts all our cognitive sensory motor affective functions. So we cannot avoid that even our higher order cognitions or our emotions or our uh, affective or sensory motor function are impacted or modulated by ourselves. And I think that what we saw this morning, the autism patient, that's exactly where this self-expansion, as had also been called here, probably doesn't take place. There are some abnormal, ma ma uh, spatial temporal abnormalities, as I would suppose, in the resting state in these autism patients. So they're not properly able to, to make this contribution of the resting state to the task evoked activity and sort of to suffuse your various functions by your sense of self. So in a way, their cognitive functions operate in a completely objective way. So this is why I would argue that that's why they are so good in certain cognitive capacity, as has been shown this morning. So, uh, and we really focus on this one uh, because this would be beyond our capacity. So, uh, now I want to come to the next point, to consciousness. I will not much discuss the relationship between self and consciousness because this is simply too complex for me uh, at this point in time, but I want to show here how is the spontaneous activity related to consciousness? And when I mean by consciousness, uh, what I show in the following, I exemplify this by patients with an anesthesia, vegetative state, or what we currently also include patients with sleep. I cannot show you data on that yet. But so when I speak about consciousness in the following, I just mean very basic, the level of arousal. But of course, when I speak about the spatial temporal structure of consciousness, I refer to what I like to say the form of consciousness. So in the current neuroscience of consciousness, you have a bi-dimensional distinction between the content of consciousness, like uh, lesion patients, this was presented in the autism talks this morning, and you have the uh, level of consciousness, the arousal. And I like to add a third dimension, the form or structure of consciousness, which I would assume is central for disorders like schizophrenia. So, um, and that leads ultimately to what I like to call, and you can see this on my website, what I call spatial temporal psychopathology. So anyway, so let me now go into the, and obviously that uh, three-dimensional distinct, particularly the form of consciousness, is not that far away from what we heard from Victoria and Michelle from the phenomenological approach to experience. So this is where I learn a lot, where it's very important for me to talk and to discuss, so what kind of formal structural elements must there be in experience and how can I link them to the brain? Okay, so here I show you some data now, go back from the heights of experience to the basic of the level of consciousness and I show here uh, you see, give you an idea of how we analyze the spontaneous activity. Uh, so these are anesthesia, anesthesia versus non-anesthesia subjects. Uh, and we did functional connectivity. And you see, surprisingly, a lot of uh, cortical midline difference between anesthesia and non-anesthesia. 
We also have yet another measure, the regional homogeneity, which basically is within the regions, just the local voxel synchronization. And here, which is very much to my heart, the variability. Uh, standard deviation is the root mean square of the amplitude. Uh, so this is basically the variability. And I'm much more interested in temporal variance or variability than functional connectivity. For various reasons, I don't want to go into that. Uh, we can discuss this. So then uh, you see the same picture in vegetative state patients because you, you don't know whether this is just specific to the drug. You have a lot of drug effects in anesthesia, so uh, you cannot exclude it. But if you see the same pattern in vegetative state patients and in uh, sleep subjects who all lose their consciousness, then it must be somewhat related to the uh, loss of the level of consciousness. So here you see again, you see a lot of cortical midline regions. Uh, and this is the, again, ALF, this is a slightly different way of calculating, but it's the same amplitude of low frequency fluctuations. This is a temporal variance. This is the root mean square of the amplitude. Uh, so this is basically the, uh, the variability or temporal variance, if you want to say. So here, functional connectivity with different uh, seed regions. And you can see it's, again, particular in the midline regions. Uh, look at this. It's also uh, more or less the same thing here. You see a lot of midline uh, involvement. So now you might want to say, is consciousness located in the midline regions? No, I, it's not. Uh, what should it compel you? Are there specific physiological features in the midline regions which are sp particular susceptible to the loss of the level of consciousness? And that's exactly what you see when you go into the basic neuroscience that these midline regions so extremely show uh, strong power in the infraslow frequency ranges when compared to the sensory cortex, for instance. Sensory cortex has more higher frequencies uh, because it makes sense, because it has to continuously pick up stimulus and you have to follow my hand, so you need higher gamma, uh, whereas the midline regions, they don't get uh, direct sensory input and they basically can do what they want to do. So they can just fluctuate and they can just take, literally take their time. And interestingly, these midline regions have been involved, strongly involved in mental time travel, the subjective extension of time. I assume that this is related to the strong infraslow frequency fluctuation. So uh, then you see the temporal variance. We also do different frequency ranges. This is a relatively new thing here in the frequency ranges. Uh, here you see the overall frequency range of fMRI data sets. Then you go into slow 5, which is uh, 0 0.01 to 0. 023, and then you go slow 4, 0.23 to 0.77, and you can see it's particular here in the perigenal anterosingulate cortex, particularly slow 5. You don't see this here. Uh, you see this here again. Uh, so this seems to be, again, a central role that here really the healthy have much more slow 5 power and variability. Variability, this is important, the variability in the power when compared to all others, compared to the vegetative and the minimally conscious state patients. So, and then we also did, this was a, a recent paper which is in press, we also did the global activity. So we did the global signal power or global signal variability. And you can see this is the uh, wakefulness, uh, the left one is the wakefulness, the consciousness, uh, unwakefulness, uh, and you can see a, a significant difference here in the vari uh, variance, temporal variance. This is the regional homogeneity, and you see also the uh, degree of centrality, basically from one voxel, one area in the brain, or all the rest of the brain. Um, so that really suggests that the whole brain is involved. Uh, and what we found, and this is very interesting, we found this in both anesthesia and vegetative state patients, so it really strongly suggests it's a marker of consciousness, uh, of the level of consciousness. So and you can see here, then we also did a correlation of these synchronization parameters, functional connectivity region to region and within region uh, signal synchronization. And you can see that they're no longer correlated with variability. And this is very important because now it would be interesting to set some of the information algorithm here and to say maybe due to the lack of this correlation, variability cannot be transformed into information transfer between different regions because of this uh, decoupling. Yeah, and then of course the question is what kind of information is transferred? I would argue is spatiotemporal information. It's not about cognitive contents. So now then we did a next study. So this was pure resting state spontaneous activity. Now next. Uh, uh, 
uh, thing which we did in these patients uh, only in the vegetative state patients. We currently run a study in anesthesia on that, that we stimulate them with the own self. Uh, see, this is a nice intersection between neuroscience philosophy uh, that really self is usually considered, maybe Owen Flanagan, uh, Flanagan might contradict, is usually considered, conceived as self-consciousness. Uh, Michel uh, Bitbull nicely pointed it out in phenomenology, pre-reflective self-consciousness, that they both are intrinsically, by default, related to each other, self and consciousness. And when you see my data, when you see the strong uh, overlap or containment of self-specific information in the resting state, and then the second presumption that every resting state, every stimulus in order to be assigned consciousness has to go through the resting state, then you would argue probably the same way. So we did this here in vegetative state patients that we uh, presented autobiographically when. So this study was done in uh, China, in uh, Shanghai. So this is why you see the question. So we asked the relatives for autobiographical questions. So this is a non-self-referential question. It's one minute, 60 minutes, pure uh, uh, semantic. And then here, have you been to Beijing? So uh, this was a uh, patient who traveled to Beijing before. This is a self-referential question. And then we were interested, of course, in the difference between these uh, 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 conditions. So uh, here, the first thing which you make, need to make experimentally show sure, because these patients cannot respond, uh, it's the very thing. They lost their level of consciousness, but they also cannot move their finger. So you would say, this, also for me, this is a very strange thing. So when you see these patients, they cannot move their finger, uh, not uh, voluntarily. Of course, you can make them move, they do a little bit, but <clears throat> you cannot make them make a button click. And that's a very strange thing. So because conceptually, this means that without consciousness, that your sensory-motor functions are also based on prior consciousness or experience. Yeah? And so the question is, what turns a movement, which is purely mechanical, into an action? Because this button click is an action. And I would argue for that you need spatial temporal structure of your spontaneous activity. If the spatial temporal structure of your spontaneous activity does not function properly anymore, then you cannot do the proper kind of action. So, and I would go even one further empirically that the spatial temporal, the statistically based spatial temporal coordinate of your action correspond to the spatial temporal coordinate of your spontaneous activity. So we have data on that supporting that by multi-sensory integration, which we're just about to submit. So here, what you need to do is you need to make sure that they really process the stimulus. You see an auditory cortex because it was an auditory stimulus, and you see that most of the subject process the stimulus. And you also need to see, look at the brain lesions, the amount of brain lesions these patients have. They're usually young patients with motorbike accidents. So uh, when you see this, you don't want to ride the motorbike anymore. Um, <clears throat> So then we compared the healthy versus the vegetative state patients for the contrast self versus non-self. And you can see here, this curve is the healthy subject uh, and here the non-healthy subject. And you see there's barely any difference between self and non-self in the vegetative state patients. So and then, uh, even more important, then we directly correlated the degree of self-non-self neuronal difference with the score of the level of consciousness is the consciousness recovery scale revised, a standard instrument for measuring the level of consciousness. And you can see the better you were able to discriminate uh, self, non-self, uh, the higher your level of consciousness. So whatever this means, I find this is clinically very important because if confirmed, you might use your self, non-self paradigm as a clinical marker for your level of consciousness. Conceptually, slash on the philosophical side, it might indicate that there is some close, intricate relationship between the two. So, and we showed this particular in the midline regions, perigenual anterior cingulate, posterior cingulate cortex. And trust me, over the years, sometimes I, th I think I'm delusional because we see these midline regions so often, uh, but so far no psychiatrist has me convinced. Five minutes, or then I need to speed up. So, what is important that we also found a correlation of the resting state variability here with the degree of self, non-self activity. Okay, so I skip 
uh, this, because I'm really running out of time, so maybe you give me five additional minutes, would be generous. Uh, so what is important that your spontaneous activity provides a neural predisposition, a certain capacity for consciousness. These are the spatial temporal repeaters. Then you remember the pre-stimulus data for the self. This might be the neural prerequisite that you need to uh, be in the uh, right kind of phase cycle duration of your frequency, and then you have the actual task evoked activity, the neural correlates of consciousness. And this is not only uh, uh, for basic neuroscience relevant, but also for clinically, because we expect that you can stage the clinical uh, prognosis according to the lesion. If you have a lesion down here, you have a worst prognosis, you might even end up in a coma, which you have, gives you a very bad prognosis. If you have a lesion here or a deficit here, you might have a good um, uh, MCS plus, which is, is called minimally consciousness state. So here you can see that basic neuroscience, clinical neuroscience, <clears throat> and ultimately I would argue this is also highly relevant for conceptual issues. Okay, um, the conceptual issues, uh, I keep them very short because I'm uh, not allowed so much time. Uh, so the basic assumption also of cons consciousness in current neuroscience and also often in philosophy of mind, it is a higher order function. So it is closely related to cognitive functions, uh, phenomenal consciousness, I pick up here the uh, net block distinction, access consciousness. Uh, and this is also reflected really in the, in the different theories of consciousness uh, in the neuroscience, like the information integration theory, the highest degree of integration. Global neuronal workspace, these are brilliant theories, but these are all ultimately what I would call higher order theories. Because, and everything, all that, the global neuronalization by De Haen, uh, or the uh, information integration as Tononi, can all happen without consciousness. Nothing of that makes consciousness necessary. And that's what you're looking for. Uh, so based on the data, I suggest a different model that maybe consciousness might be a very basic function of your brain's spontaneous activity and its relationship to the world, which will be the last point. Uh, so now I go this one, I have to rush through. We did a recent uh, study where we looked uh, in adult uh, subjects for uh, childhood uh, experiences. Uh, so we recorded childhood experience with a, a standard questionnaire, CTQ, uh, childhood traumatic uh, questionnaire. And then we correlated, so that was the early childhood, that was like being bullied, being outsider, not selected for soccer, and these kind of questions. And then we linked that to a spatial temporal measure like entropy in the resting state. And what you can see here on the right, so um, the higher your degree of early childhood trauma, the higher your degree of entropy in the spontaneous activity. In a way, this is a very crazy finding because, I mean, here, the early childhood is an early childhood, and this was 20 years later. But it seems to be that there is this early relationship to the environment deeply encoded, and in an, this is important, in an individual way encoded into the spontaneous activity. So and this is something we see better and better prediction for individual, because so far, uh, imaging has not delivered much, because for clinical things, we cannot predict the individual. So and here, in additional sense, you also see that the level of glutamate in this region also was related to the uh, early childhood experience. So, and then we also did uh, uh, that we tested an aversive paradigm because assumed that subjects with early childhood trauma uh, react differently to aversive stimuli. So this was a little tactile shock here, electric shock. Uh, and you can see that uh, this is an overlap, and you see, in particular here, the sensory motor cortex insula, and you see a correlation of the reaction to the aversive stimuli with uh, the early childhood trauma. So meaning there are two main messages of this study, that first, uh, you have a very diachronic relationship to the environment in your spontaneous activities, this is somehow uh, encoded in there in yet unclear ways, and second, uh, this impact the current function, the response to the aversive stimuli. So, what does this imply? This is the second to last slide. What does this imply for the model of the brain? So I would argue that you might need to, when you see these findings, and this is confirmed by other findings, that you need to suggest a neuroecological model of brain. So this leads you philosophically to somebody like Whitehead. And, and I would argue uh, that that also changes the coordinates for what we call mind 
brain problem. So you have the world, you have certain life events, you have certain uh, spatial temporal statistically based structures, if you want to put it in a formal way. And they sort of, the intrinsic activity or spontaneous activity can pick them up more or less. That's probably due to some individual genetic differences based on your spontaneous activity. And that in turn, uh, you might want to call, I would call this philosophically the world brain problem. And this is, for me, a problem which is right at the uh, border between the ontological and the epistemic. So it's right at the border. So this is one thing. So as such, this is a purely merological problem of whole and part. That's the first aspect of that world brain problem. The second part of that world brain problem is, if I can show that this world brain relationship is a necessary condition for possible experience and mental states, and con like consciousness, then uh, we might first, before going to the mind-brain, we might need to discuss it as a world brain problem. So it has two facets. Yes, yes, it's second to last slide. And I'm hallucinating, I know. Um, so, and then you have an output. You have all kinds of cognitive functions, and then you have uh, mind the gap, you know this from airports, and then you have the relationship between the spontaneous activity and uh, cognition, which is a purely empirical problem. And then you have the mind-brain problem, which from my perspective is a purely epistemological problem. It's not an ontological. So I would be very radical here with Kant. I would say this is a false inference, a fallacy from the epistemological domain to the ontological domain. Kant demonstrated that beautifully in Descartes, and I would say that the whole philosophy of mind rests on this. Um, yeah, that's basically the end. So here, this is in a book which came out last year. So here I really discuss the empirical mechanism of this world-brain relationship in terms of a particular code, uh, what I would assume difference-based coding. Uh, then I apply this uh, to consciousness here. So here I discuss the form of consciousness, the different phenomenal feature. Intentionality, unity, self-perspectival organization, temporal continuity, spatial continuity, and qualia. And I spatial temporalize qualia. So qualia are for me virtual statistically based spatial temporal feature. This is not to be confused with the kind of space and time and discrete points in time and space we observe. So this is very important. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so, and this is, I think, this goes, of course, against philosophy because I think this is the problem. The only uh, branch which somewhat, as I said, I don't know the Indian philosophy, which tackled that, that mental features are usually considered as non-spatial, non-temporal. Yes, they are non-spatial, non-temporal in the observational sense in third-person perspectives. That's correct. That goes back to Descartes. But it doesn't mean that they are uh, not spatial temporal in a different sense, in a statistically based or virtual sense. And that's exactly what I'm getting. And for instance, uh, I had this morning the, 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 the talk about art, autism and also schizophrenia. This is what we're currently doing. I asked these patients for the experience of space and time and try to make basically a, a, a frequency or a power spectrum of their formal and fully, purely temporal features of their thought contents. That goes back to early phen phenomenological psychiatry. And you can see, and I would argue that the time perception impacts your cognition. So if your frequency fluctuations are constantly interrupted and not coupled, of course also your, your thoughts are also disrupted. And that's exactly what you see in these patients. So for me these symptoms and mental features in general are spatial temporal. And ontologically, or at the border ontologically, epistemologically, leads, this leads to the world brain problem, which I touch upon this one. Thank you very much. Thanks for the stimulating talk. Uh, now take up a few questions. Uh, uh, those who want to ask the question, please keep it very brief. Um, in view of the time, uh, maybe we will take uh, three questions, uh, and then we will have to break it. Yeah, please keep it very brief. So, uh, George, thank you very much for your excellent talk. Um, I have uh, nevertheless a problem that I want to share with you. 
uh, you explained that uh, in, in uh, states like uh, anesthesia, sleep, and vegetative state, uh, you obtain uh, virtually the same pattern, and therefore you concluded that the missing elements or the, or the common elements, at least, uh, between these three states were likely to be correlated with consciousness. But the problem is that uh, in order to say that, you have to accept that in these three states you have no sort of consciousness at all. And uh, that by difference between the normal states, the waking state in which you have consciousness and these states in which you have no consciousness, you um, you deduce the neural correlate of consciousness. But I challenge this uh, point of view because there are, uh, you know, there are signs. In, for instance, uh, when you study an anesthesia, there are signs there is, there is still something like experience, uh, fleeting, instantaneous, and wh whatever you want, but there is still some experience. And then, therefore, you cannot say there is, uh, you, you know, there is no sort of consciousness at all. So this is a difficulty for deducing that you are um, showing the neural correlates of consciousness. Okay. I think I wait for the other two questions yeah. then I will just take uh, maybe one question. I'm sorry for the lack of time. Yeah, and then we'll have the answers for both the questions. Uh, we know Deshmukh neurologist. Uh, you seem to emphasize spontaneous activity in the midline cortical structures. But I think we need to realize that there is a lot of spontaneous activity in the subcortex, in the midbrain, in the reticular activating system, and also what Antonio Damasio calls the homeostatic system that maintains the organism as a whole, which feeds into reticular activating system, which then activates the cortex. And if you look at the model of epilepsy, absence seizures, petit mal seizures, it is always cortico-reticular. It's not one or the other, but both. And therefore, my feeling is that for explanation of conscious arousal and consciousness, we need to include the spontaneous activity in the brain stem as well as midline cortical structure. Thank you. Yeah. OK, let me start with the second, and then I come to the first question. Uh, certainly true, the, what I call the cortical midline structures are basically evolutionary in an extension of the limbic system uh, subcortical, and we have papers on this, it's a subcortical cortical, uh, midline system. So certainly true, uh, I agree completely with that. Uh, and you could see uh, um, that we had this whole brain measure uh, variability, and that in GLEED includes the subcortical regions. So I completely agree with that. But I would not agree that the subcortical is basically the origin in whatever there is a loss of consciousness. I do think that there is no origin in the brain, but there's a certain spatial temporal dynamics which operates across different regions. And the distinction between different regions' activity is secondary to the underlying spatial temporal dynamics. This is a very strange view for, for a modular proponent of the brain. But this is the way I assume. For a dynamical person, it's probably no problem here. Yeah? So regional specifications are secondary to the underlying dynamics. Um, and then, of course, I would never deny that the uh, body plays a certain role. But you have to go beyond the nice metaphors, which are suggested by certain authors. Uh, you have to make it very concrete. Uh, you have to say that the continuous interceptive input and how that structures the spontaneous activity. That would be, for instance, one thing which is highly interesting to investigate. Uh, I hope I answered that question. <clears throat> Epilepsy is an interesting model. Um, there has been not so much research. I mean, there has been a lot of research on, on, on epilepsy, but not particularly in relation to consciousness as in vegetative state. Uh, the first study, the first comment by uh, you, by Michel, um, yeah, so nice, of course, it's always bad if a philosopher accuses you of a fallacy. Basically, <laughs> you're not allowed to infer this is logical. Yeah, you're right. Uh, but uh, you suggest that I make my inference on the basis of a certain presupposition, which I don't. So the presupposition upon which your argument rests, that there is an all or nothing 
of the level of consciousness and slash its underlying neuronal mechanisms. No, that's not. So there is a different degree of neural predisposition. So that's, I'm not talking here about neural correlates. You did not hear anything that I said neural correlates of consciousness. I had the slide and then the clock ruthlessly brought me out of that where I distinguish this neural predisposition, neural prerequisite, neural correlates. And what I argue, what I showed you in the data, was just about the neural predispositions, and they can be realized in different degrees. And that, of course, where you have also a certain individual susceptibility. So in the patients who have a low susceptibility to anesthetic drugs, might exactly where you need more drug, which, uh, <clears throat> in order to make them unconscious, then exactly the patients will. And it is for clinicians, again, this is very interesting. I discussed this long with anesthesiologists. It's a big problem for them because they cannot uh, titrate the degree of the drug. You can make it a little longer if you want. Yeah. We, they cannot titrate the, the, the concentration of the drug for individual. So usually they give too much drug to everybody. For some patients it's the right doses, but for others it might be too much and then they have memory problems afterwards. So this is a real problem. My hope is that we can individually specify by certain measures like spatial temporal measures, uh, the spontaneous activity and make proper clinical predictions. So now it's no longer a fallacy. I have to object this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we had a, uh, uh, through to the credentials, we had the topic ranging from Immanuel Kant to single neuron uh, uh, studies. Uh, I'm helpless because uh, some arrangements need to be done at this place for the next program. So that's the whole reason that I have to shut the show. Uh, but we will have the discussions because we have a coffee break uh, next. Um, uh, yeah, so the uh, talk has left us with some very, very deep questions like uh, whether consciousness is basic because we all believed that it's a higher level of uh, cognition and uh, we as human beings want to be, maybe want to believe that we are different and we want to be higher level, but uh, it raises some very, very deep questions like whether consciousness is basic as well as whether it's our self is nothing but the resting state of the brain, are they both same, which again raises a very deep philosophical question. Um, so we, with those questions, I uh, leave it. We will break for the uh, coffee break, and we will reassemble at the uh, same po uh, place at uh, 7 o'clock. Thank you. Thanks for this.